Hello, everyone. So hello, everyone, and uh, well, welcome to this um, webinar that we are um, uh, focusing today on um, LNAPL skimming. I'm just seeing that uh, I think that there's quite a lot of people who are still uh, entering, so we might wait for another one minute and then we will uh, we will start and then I'll, I'll introduce the, our speakers today and uh, then let them talk and Peter talk. So let's wait for another minute and uh, then we'll start. Right away. All right, so um, let's go then. Um, good morning, good afternoon to uh, all of you. Uh, my name is Jan Hamers from Hamers Technologies, and I'm uh, very glad and honored to uh, host this webinar that we will focus on uh, uh, light non aqueous face liquid squimming, so l napple skimming. Um, just for the, for the practicalities of this webinar, uh, during the presentations, I invite all of you to Put to use the chat, send me directly or send in the chat your questions in uh, in writing, uh, and then I will take care of all these questions and, and get them uh, hopefully answered directly by our speakers today. Uh, and even if some of some of your questions are not uh, answered directly, uh, don't worry, we'll follow up and uh, get you some uh, some answers in writing in, uh, in 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 the next few days. So. Um, Let's jump into it and let's start. Uh, the, the presentation will be done today in two parts. We have uh, two distinguished, di distinguished guests. Um, the first part will be hosted and will be done by uh, Patrick Francois. And Patrick is, uh, he owns a master in uh, civil engineering from the Polytechnic School of uh, Louvain and also a master of business administration of EASC uh, Business School. He studied, he studied even further and followed the uh, geology courses in the uh, University of Liège. So he pretty well uh, foc I mean, concentrated in this field of expertise, began his career very long time ago in France as an engineer in the R&D department of a major computer manufacturer. Then uh, he held several finance and administrative management positions with large international groups in many industries, ICT, pharmaceutical, automotive. Um, then he worked in quite a bunch of countries, uh, has extensive experience in international collaboration. Since 2012, so it's been 10 years now, he's been managing the company ODS International, which is specialized in LNAPL uh, skimming and developed the DynaSkim technology. And uh, that is now operating uh, under Hamers, and he will uh, extensively explain that uh, today, now. Uh, and once that is done, he will, uh, he will then share the floor with uh, Yannick, Yannick Lolivier. He, Yannick holds a master in chemical engineering and material engineering at the University of Brussels. Uh, started his career as a junior enge engineer at the Global Cement and the Concrete Association, where he worked on different environmental related issues in the concrete industry. Uh, for example, reducing CO2 and mercury emissions. He now works as a project engineer at uh, Hamer's Technologies. So, these are our two speakers today, and uh, I'm eager to leave the floor to you, Patrick, and we're all ears to uh, you, so the floor is yours. Thank you, Jan, for this nice uh, introduction. So now let's move to the subject of this uh, webinar. Uh, here you see the problem that uh, we solve, that is the elimination of 100% of the free phase that has accumulated above the water table. There are four conditions for uh, l napple skimming to work. The pollutant must be lighter than water. The pollutant must be poorly soluble into water. The pollutant must have reached the groundwater level and the soil must be permeable. There are several systems used to recover the free phase, and here you see some of the most common equipment available on the market. However, the systems have disadvantages, like highly sensitive to viscosity and clogging, 
unsuited to groundwater level variations, high effluent water production, high electric consumption or fuel or diesel consumption if you have large compressors, incapability to recover very thin layers, risk of secondary pollution, emergent production, no central storage of recovered product or high maintenance cost. The DynaScheme solution, it's after using these systems that, uh, that we have used ourselves and being unsatisfied that we came up with a new design that we patented. The DynaScheme solution is made of two components, the skimmer that you see on the left side and the pumping unit. In terms of physical process, the DynaScheme solution works by vacuum suction through the inlet of the skimmer. This is one of the key elements that differentiate us from all other technologies. On the left side, you can see the original four inch skimmer. It follows water table variations up to two and a half meters. And the float is positioned naturally at the free phase level. On the right side, you can see a pumping unit which can vary in size depending on the project scope. Here you see a DS500. I will present now to you two short videos. The first one is about the general concept of the DynaScheme solution. So, of course, you first have an incident with a big leak. In order to reach the uh, free phase, one must uh, bore wells. We come and install our turnkey containers and they are connected to the wells with hoses. And we are with vacuum uh, sucking the product into a tank and then transferring that to a storage tank. The key point here is that we always are always able to follow groundwater level fluctuations. All right, so of course a real project is a bit more complicated than that and takes a little bit longer. Let's move to the second video. In this video you will see how the skimmer up oh, no not next page in this video you see how the skimmer operates inside the well the first phase is when the free phase is uh, migrating into the well here you see that the float is totally capable of moving along the oh, of course, the, there is a freeze here. Okay. Migration of the product into the well. The float is always able to adjust to the groundwater table. And then we have the skimming. Up to the last millimeter, we are able to pump the product. And then the water pours again into the well. So let's talk about the details of the DynaScheme process. The system works with pumping cycles that are launched with a period that is set by the refill rate of the well. Each well has a specific pumping time based on the amount of product that can be recovered from the well and the gravel pack around the well. The standard DS400 pumping unit has a settling tank and a storage tank of 0.8 cubic meters. The pumping unit includes a coalescence separator and the units have remote monitoring and control.
When we operate in depth of less than 8.5 meter, we can connect a unit to up to 40 wells. And if the depth is more than 8.5 meters, we can connect a central unit to 18 wells. Here you see a diagram of a unit with in the center the vacuum tank, which is connected to the wells with hoses. The settling tank and the storage tank and the vacuum uh, pump and just beside that the uh, coalescent separator. When we need to operate at depth greater than 8.5 meter, we use an intermediate chamber. Our unique selling proposition is to succeed where other skimming technologies reach their limits. The float follows water table fluctuations up to two and a half meters. The system can pump viscous products and thin layers. You have seen the video up to the last millimeter. It requires little maintenance, usually one site visit every four to six weeks. Here I have to say that during the last two years, due to the pandemic and due to cross-border travel restrictions, we had some units operating for nearly three months without any site maintenance, and they were operating very fine. There is very little effluent water produced, and I will elaborate that on the next slide. Low energy consumption, about one kilowatt hour, and we can connect one pumping unit up to 40 wells. And this is also a turnkey solution that requires very little time to uh, put on site. Here I want to explain uh, the, and compare three different uh, phases that we had on the project. It was an oil terminal uh, that had a large unleaded petrol leak. Three separate uh, phases were uh, run on this project. First, a project with pump and treat. And you see here the amount of water that was produced and the amount of free phase that was recovered through the pump and treat process. Then the uh, operator used pneumatic active skimmers. You still see an improvement in the recovery rate, but still nearly 73% of water. And thereafter, we came with the DynaSkim solution, and you see the improvement. We have 87% of free phase and 12% of uh, water. So, um, our motto is always beyond other skimming technologies limits, because we have always succeeded where other technologies have failed. We have a proven track record with major petrochemical and environmental companies. We have executional experience to operate in the international market, and we have today equipment to run pilot tests on short notice. Our aim is that our DynaSkim solution becomes a worldwide reference for El Napel skimming. What are the customer benefits? Well, a 100% recovery of hydrocarbon free phase, no disruptions to site activities, a faster elimination of free phase and site rehabilitation, reduction of CO2 impact and site cost of re remediation, and reduced people exposure to product. In action, how does the project look like? The first phase is boring of the wells. Then we deliver the equipment. In a few days, we tune the installation. Then we have the project running and maintenance with visits every four to six weeks. And at the end, we have the mobilization and the equipment returns to Belgium. We have units designed for industrial sites in uh, three, um, three um, 10 foot containers, sorry, not three, 10 foot containers, three meter containers. And we also have units 
for residential areas. Now let's talk about a few projects. I will cover four different projects. This project is a project with skimmers for four inch and range uh, of two and a half meters. Uh, there was a potential uh, water table fluctuation of more than two and a half meters per day. We were pumping hydrocarbons and BTEX uh, products. We operated with eight wells at about 12 meter depth. And this was uh, an ATEX solution. So the result is that we pumped 134 cubic meters of products over a period of about five years. Project B, this uh, project is using a mix of two and four inch skimmers because we are operating with new wells and also with some uh, narrow uh, legacy wells. The product recover is a mix of phenol and cresol de derivatives that become very viscous at room temperature. The soil is limestone, so not very permeable and the well refill rate is very heterogeneous due to the presence of cracks in the soil. Uh, the water table variation over the year is around two and a half to three meters and over a period of uh, one, say one, one and a half months, it can fluctuate up to 60 centimeters to a little bit less than one meter. Uh, we operate with eight wells and a depth of 22 meters. Here we have recovered about 21 cubic meters of uh, pure product since 2012. That is about 5.8 liters per day. The third project was operated with two inch skimmers uh, that had a range of 25 centimeters. Uh, the, leak was, uh, the, the leak product was diesel. And we operated with 20 wells, large wells with diameter of uh, 0.6 meters and 2.5 meter depth. Uh, in this project, uh, the skimming was done together with a drawdown of between 20 and 50 centimeters. A drawdown was made necessary to repatriate the free phase from under the warehouse of the neighbor. Uh, the uh, Groundwater table uh, variation was between 50 and 70 centimeters per year. One uh, important uh, thing to notice is that the uh, drawdown increased by a factor of two, the recovery rate. And we recovered about uh, 17 cubic meters of product over four years. The fourth project, Project D used a combination of four inch skimmers and surface skimmers. It was a leak on a pipeline. Uh, we had six wells, four meter deep, and the uh, groundwater level variation could be up to one meter per year. So we had two steps implementation. A first step with excavations and surface skimmers. You see the picture on the right side on the corner uh, of the slide. And then also we operated later with wells, large wells and four inch skimmers. Um, we recovered about 90% of the total uh, volume in the first four months. And in the total of eight months, we recover about six uh, cubic meters of uh, product. Now I will show you a video, a live video of how the uh, skimming operated inside the well. This video is uh, at an accelerated rate of uh, eight times, and you will see the product moving towards the center of the well, and at the same time, you will see bubbles uh, coming uh, at the top of the surface, and this is the uh, product that is uh, coming from the water through the uh, suction of the product in the middle of the well. I hope the video will work a little bit better than the last one. Okay, yes, the video worked very well. So you see why it is important to have a skimmer that can follow 
the uh, water table variation because through the skimming, the water table decreases slowly. And if you don't follow that variation, you will only pump air, or if you are too low, you will only pump water. Okay, Yannick, it's your turn. Um, hi, everyone. So now that uh, Patrick Francois has explained uh, his um, Dynas scheme solution, I will now uh, present the enhanced dynamic skimming. So first, what's uh, the issue uh, that we can encounter in dynamic skimming? It's mainly the viscosity of the contaminant. I will just quickly uh, show you this uh, small video of uh, viscosity. Of. And so you see that uh, that's the type of products we can collect it uh, by pumping the free phase. It's here a mixture of phenol and cresol, so it's four to eight times more viscous than water. Um, so it's not the only type of product we can uh, collect. There is also motor oils, for example, that are even more viscous than that, more than 100 times more viscous than water. And you will say, what's the problem? Because you can collect it, we saw on the video. The problem, in fact, is more for the mobilization of the contaminant into the ground to the pumping well. And so we want to reduce the viscosity of the contaminant while we are doing the dynamic skimming. And for that, we will use the correlation between the viscosity and the temperature. You can see on this graph, uh, so it's an example for the water, but it works for every liquid or contaminant that by increasing the temperature from 5 uh, degrees to 65 degrees, we can decrease the viscosity by a factor of three. Um, and so, like I said, we can do the same thing for the contaminant into the, the ground and in the free phase, and it will help mobilize the contaminant into the ground uh, to go uh, faster to the pumping well. It's something that we have observed on different thermal desorption sites, I will show you later some um, some case study to to explain um, what we saw and the difference in pumping rate. First, I will just quickly introduce uh, so the thermal desorption, uh, more precisely the smart burner, so the technologies of Amherst Technologies. And in fact, the thermal desorption it's uh, eating the soil by conduction, and so we have the burner here, um, the the box. With two concentric tubes, we send hot air in the first tube that will then goes up in the external tube, and by conduction the soil will eat and so the and so the contaminants. Um, once we reach a certain temperature, the contaminants will vaporize and we can then uh, suck the vapor up um, by means of all the tube in the suction here. So uh, I think you see it coming. The idea is to combine the dynamic skimming and um, the thermal desorption to um, make the project faster in dynamic skimming. So the first case here that you can see on the animation is the one that Patrick explained. So you only have the dynamic, uh, the dynamic skim solution with dynamic um, skimming, and then um, one of the case we want to 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 present is um, this one. So you have the thermal desorption installation that it will, that will eat the ground and the groundwater. Um, and you have uh, besides the uh, Dynaskim solution. The idea here is not only to eat the free phase and to help the dynamics, uh, the Dynaskim solution to pump the free phase, but also to eat up the ground, the, the ground above the ground water that may be also uh, contaminated. And so by eating in uh, the ground and in the soil, we can uh, remediate uh, both of them. But we can have a case where the ground is not contaminated above the ground water. You only, you only have the free phase. And then in this case, oops, sorry, in this case, um, you can just use a remoted flame 
So the idea is to just um, to deport to to make the flame um, deeper in the ground to only eat uh, the free phase uh, to help the to help remediate the free phase. So I mainly talk about the viscosity uh, effect, but in fact there is also other physical phenomena that can hinder the mobilization of um, the contaminant to the ground. The first one is the interfacial tensions. So it's the force that are exist between two immiscible uh, liquids, in this case the water and the contamination, the hydrocarbon, and by eating uh, the ground you can easily break this bond. The other one is the absorption coefficient. So um, it's the same thing, but more the fact that the, the, the contaminant is fixed to the soil matrix and by eating the soil, you will release the contamination into the groundwater to pump it um, with the dynamic skimming. So now, uh, like I already said, I will just present some case studies, two of them. The first one was in France, where there was um, big pollution with motor oils in the free phase. I present here some of uh, the, the oil that were present in the free phase, so different oil grades, and you see that uh, depending on the grade, the viscosity can be very different, but in every case, very high viscosity. And the important thing here uh, to note is that by increasing the temperature to zero degrees to 99 degrees, you can decrease the viscosity by a factor of 13 to 19 uh, for the uh, higher old grade. That's the theoretical thing that we want to explore to, uh, in, in, in this case. And we then come with the thermal desumption solution to help a pump the, the free phase. And so you can see on this graph that uh, the orange, the clear orange here aligned is the, the evolution of the all layer thickness in the pumping well at a temperature of 18 degrees. And you see that after 900 uh, minutes, you only have in the better case, one meter in uh, one meter of contamination in the pumping well. While by eating up to 28 degrees, in half the time, you have already 1.4 meter uh, of contamination. And if you increase even more the temperature, you can, you can fill um, even quicker the pumping well. So now some number to visualize uh, how much um, the pumping rate is increased by increasing the temperature. At 18 degrees, we have a rate of pumping of 0.1 cubic meter. Uh, in this case, per hour, and uh, when we eat up to 28 degrees, we have a pumping rate of 0 0.7, so we increase the rate of uh, by a factor of 7. When we eat up to 45 degrees, we, we reach 1.5 cubic meter per hour, so again a factor of 2. At the end, um, if we look at all the projects, by increasing only by 27 degrees from 18 to 45 degrees, we reach a better ratio by a factor of 15. Uh, 15. And uh, now the, the, the other case study was in Italy where there was hydrocarbons in the soil and in the, and in the groundwater. There were um, pumping the groundwater, and you can see that when we start uh, the thermal desumption into the ground, at first, before eating, we have no more than 100 liters a day uh, of, um, of oil. But when we start eating, you can see that we are more about, in a, on, on average, between 100 and 200 uh, liters a day. So again, it's a proof that uh, it works. And so now to conclude, um, we can clearly see that temperature enhances the mobility of the contaminant uh, from the ground to uh, the pumping well. And the, um, it, it, 
really can improve the time of a remediation and this kind of project can be very long so it's very important that we can reduce the time of such project uh, of uh, dynamic skimming and uh, so we propose the combination of thermal disruption and dynamic skimming what is interesting in the thermal disruption is that we can adapt the solution if the contaminant is uh, also present in the ground above the the water um so that's it for for me uh, thank you for your attention and uh, we will respond to all your questions well well thank you very much to both of you uh, patrick and yannick uh, for these uh, quite interesting presentations and um, I'll, I'll i'll jump to a first question uh, right away uh, and that was related to patrick directly about uh, how you monitor that uh, so the question is remote telemetry is that is that uh, uh, available are you capable of that uh, maybe put your microphone on uh, patrick that's technology <laughs> no my mic okay yeah now my mic okay, is on. okay yeah, now we yeah. hear you yes so, uh, so yes, our our, our, um, our uh, controller is uh, connected to a modem via um, a SIM card. So we have internet connection and SMS connection. And uh, the way we run our system is that we monitor uh, three counters. In, in addition to the alarms that we get if we have a, a breakdown, we monitor uh, three uh, parameters, three counters and uh, we get a report every morning at seven o'clock because uh, that's what we, we were used to to know in the morning where we stand and also these counters allow us to uh, determine uh, how much uh, fluids we have recovered over a period of uh, 24 hours so yes we are we are monitoring that in addition to that we can put sensors in the storage tanks and setting tanks that can monitor the amount of uh, free phase that is accumulating in those tanks. Well, thank you very much. I can encourage uh, if there are um, other questions just to type it in the, in, in the chat and, and we'll go for it. Or here's, here's one on, how do you manage issues on smoke when combining uh, skimming and heating? Uh, and the question is to Yannick, obviously, and uh, do we do lab tests before? We did not. Um make lab tests because we have the information we are on on the different sites like i show and how do you manage uh, issues on smokes it's the same thing for uh, thermal disruption i mean we have the tube um, to suck up the vapor so it's really the same thing just that we will put um, with the thermal disruption the dynamic skimming yeah maybe just to add on that it's it's um yeah, I mean, of course, there will be some vaporization. Heating the l apple will 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 generate. That's the whole purpose of heating it very gently. Will 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 generate a reduction in viscosity, as Yannick explained. And there is also always a little bit of vaporization, and you know, a a, a, a correct ISTD system always has vapor extraction wells that collect all these vapors. So that's uh, uh, that's taken care of. So thank you, uh, Yannick. Maybe a question back to you, uh, Patrick. Uh, maximum temperature of the skimmers as they are now and as they are with as they are designed for combination. Uh, what is the maximum temperature you are? Uh, I mean, it's it, they are made of stainless steel and uh, HDPD, uh, high density polyethylene. So I, I would say that uh, up to 60, uh, 70 degrees, I would feel very comfortable. Uh, when we reach uh, 100 degrees, I think it's going to be uh, maybe uh, we have to think about it, but I don't know if you really want to heat the groundwater up to 100 degrees and have it boiling. So, yeah. no, no, and, and, yeah. and additionally, it, there has to be uh, what needs to be said is there is a difference between the temperature of the heating elements and the soil itself and then the temperature of the uh, skimming wells, because of course, they're empty at all the time, so they are much colder than, and they're mm -hmm. far away from the place where you heat. So it, it, it's yeah. different kinds of country. I would, I mean, and they're also in direct connection with the groundwater, which obviously exactly. never goes above 100 degrees, not even close to that. So yeah. Uh, so thank you, Patrick. Um, 
I can already answer the question about North America, where we do not have uh, uh, vendors yet. So, uh, uh, but for those who will be uh, present at Battelle, uh, come and come and uh, just contact me, and we'll be at Battelle next week, or otherwise we, we can we can meet uh, we can meet at any other time. Yeah, we're we're quite interested. Um, a question uh, related to you, Patrick, also about uh, ATEX and Actus. which well, devices are ATEX rated, when not, and, and because we've had those uh, different yeah, cases. Of course, of course. I'll leave it up to you, the question regarding ATEX. Well, the, the skimmer don't need to be ATEX rated because there is no electrical component. It's only uh, stainless steel component and polyethylene, no electrical component, and they are inside the water. So there is no need to have that. Uh, the equipment itself above the ground can be ATEX uh, rated. We had systems running inside refineries, fully ATEX rated. Uh, so it's it's totally possible we do that. Uh, it's also a question of how much uh, money you want to invest because uh, any sensor or electrical uh, pump that is ATEX or not ATEX has a different price. But it's, uh, yes, it's not absolutely not a problem. No, no, in many cases, our ATEX and any others are not depending on indeed on the site. Yeah. Uh, another question relates to uh, alternative heating because indeed the cases that were presented are uh, are used with you know conventional well combustion heating wells and uh, can it be applied with uh, electrical conductive or resistive heating? Um, Yannick, you want to answer? I don't really see an issue with that. Or yes, but. I think it, it may be a, a solution also, but uh, in yeah. our case, uh, we are using uh, thermal assumption by uh, hot air in situ. Uh, but yeah, it can be also uh, investigated. Yeah, just so I can add to that. Uh, we also have applications where we do electrical conductive heating. We don't do resistive heating, but this system could perfectly be, uh, be, be applied if it's heated by resistive heating. And to be fair about microwave, uh, we haven't done any of that and have no experience. But essentially, we don't see any issue with it. The, 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 purpose, the, the purpose is, on the one hand, the skimming is there to make sure that in the most effective way, the, 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 the well is, is emptied of only the, the, the oil part. That's the, the core business of the dynamic skimming, is make sure that you only take oil so that you don't lower the water table and create another problem. And the heating, no matter how it is done, in this case, we do it in combination usually with the VADO zone treatment so that the energy is almost freely available, but can be done in any other uh, fashion, is there to reduce viscosity and to make sure that your well is filling on a much faster pace. So where your conventional treatment could take 10 to 15 years in with a gentle heating, you can be talking about reducing your overall time frame and Consequently, your overall energy consumption, you know, by a factor of five or ten, which is quite substantial. So I don't see any limitations on how you heat it. The, the, the issue is heating. The question then to you, Patrick, on the cold, um, on the cold uh, dyna skimming. Um, if, so if we don't heat, what is the most viscous products we had success with? And then uh, what rate oil, of maintenance and cleaning? Mo motor things? oil. Motor oil we have been able to pump. Motor oil. Uh, this this uh, products, chemical products, deri derivatives of uh, phenol and cresol. Uh, th those when the, the derivatives of uh, phenol and cresol is a complicated case because uh, I mean actually the, the, the product doesn't move very fast in the ground, of course, because it is very viscous. And uh, it's almost it's interesting to see that the the only way to recover that is really to uh, take the the water that is at the uh, top uh, of the groundwater. So we, we pump some water, but the water that is at the top is very contaminated. And by using a settling tank, this contamination is moving at the top of the settling tank, and this is how we accumulate. Because in 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 that site. To clean our uh, tools uh, that we use and that are contaminated, we need to use water at 80 degrees. Uh, of course, they mean today the client doesn't want to heat the soil at 22 uh, meters depth at 80 degrees. So we 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 pump broad free phase. We we pump some water, 
Uh, and once once it is, I mean, when we operate there in the winter, uh, the product crystallizes in the winter. So you can't even move it out of our uh, our tanks. We we can only pump it out of our tanks in the summer. All right, thank you. Uh, another question for you, Yannick. Uh, how many burners do you use per skimmer to ensure like reduction of viscosity? Um, we don't really made already a, a study of that, but I think it will depend mainly on the contaminant also and the viscosity we want to reach because every contaminant will have its own uh, relation with the with the temperature and the viscosity will not decrease um, by the same order of magnitude depending on the temperature. And so yeah, it, we are seeing it's something that we have to design in function of the site, in function of uh, the gone water and, and the contaminants. All right, thank you. Maybe just a, a, as an indication to the to the question regarding how many, uh, I can relate to one project uh, in design right now where it's a combination where, of course, the Vado zone is contaminated and there is El Napo. So there, of course, there is a relatively high density of heating elements to treat the Vado zone. And then one out of four heating elements is just a little deeper and goes into the uh, into the El Napal and the top of the groundwater. So it's one out of four, 25% of the wells are a little deeper so that it, it increases it. So, but but indeed it, it's case by case, depends on the geology, depends on the thickness and, and the target of, score, of, of course. Maybe a last question again. Um, um, mobility is determined by viscosity and permeability, of course. Can heating increase efficiency of skimming in low permeability geology? Question maybe to you, Yannick. Um, it's a good question. Um, and <laughs> to be honest, I don't know. But if, if you want, I, I, I can take over from there. Yeah. But um, indeed, the, the low permeability is always a problem, especially when you're below 100 degrees. Usually with heating, we, we overcome the issue because we create permeability by, by boiling the water. But there's no question that uh, low permeability is a problem. Just even increasing from increasing viscosity allows you to have a better flow. But if your flow is limited by permeability, heating it to 60, 70, 80 degrees will not suffice to overcome that permeability loss. Once you go above 100 in Vado zones, then the, 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 it's a complete different story because the water is taken out and now you create cracks and you create permeability. So you have an other permeability. But um, but but in low permeability, that's the restrictive factor. Um, what what does help, however, is the fact that since your viscosity and your your binding uh, forces are uh, are released, or the viscosity is is much lower, even if it's lower permeability, it still flows at low permeability. Whereas if it were cold, it would not flow at all. So so it. But your permeability will be your limited factor, and that's relates to the previous questions to Yannick about, you know, how many heater elements do you need? If it's lower permeability, you probably want a little bit more than if it's high permeability, where you can, where you can have a, a larger radius of influence. Nothing, nothing pretty new in this, but yes, that, that's uh, typically the case. Um, then a uh, uh, second to last question, <laughs> what's the typical uh, testing scenario for a new site that you're engaged on? So maybe Patrick, what, yes. what, what do you do before you so really Get, get your boots on the ground. So we, what, what happens uh, quite uh, often is that uh, other technologies are tested first and then they come to us when they have failed. That's uh, in 50% of the case, uh, they want to take the cheapest solution and they try and after one or two years, uh, they have pumped a lot of water or they have pumped nothing or the site is really very dirty and they come to us. So the way we operate- let's, is assume that, that, let's assume that's changing and now with, with <laughs> aware of this, Okay, what do right. they do and what so, is, if you want to start from the beginning, how would you do? So what, what we usually do is that we start by operating with existing wells, with a small uh, unit, two or three wells, four wells, uh, uh, a test uh, for uh, three, four, uh, five, six months to uh, check uh, what is the recovery rate, how much product can come into the well and to help determine what should be the, the grid or the distance between two wells. Uh, because what, what happens very often when we start is uh, after two or three days, we recover a lot of product. 
But this is because the well is, I mean, the area around the well is very saturated. So, of course, the refill rate is very fast. But after one week, you have to draw from far away right? because you have removed the free phase that is around the well. And, uh, and so it's very dangerous to only look at the results of two or three days and they say, OK, this is a recovery rate times this number of days. And in six months, everything is finished. So we, we run, we recommend usually to uh, run a test uh, between, uh, I would say, uh, two and six months uh, before investing a lot of money into uh, wells. Now, of course, it depends how deep you have to go. If you have to drill wells in sand at three or four meters deep, the price is not the same as if you have to go 20 meters or 22 meters deep in, uh, in rock or in, uh, uh, in, in places where it's quite difficult to, uh, to drill boreholes. So yes, uh, a test between two and six months. And after that, we come with a more industrial solution where we can have a long term plan and uh, uh, a simulation or calculation about uh, the, the duration of the project. All right, thank you. Uh, next question is also for you. Maximum pumping rate uh, of, uh, uh, of, of the, the, the skimming uh, pumps and then at the surface, how do you separate what you have pumped? Huh, the maximum. Uh, when what we do is we pump everything that is in, coming into the well. That's really so. We have never been uh, we have never been limited by the fact that we cannot pump fast enough. I mean, we we suck with a vacuum of almost one bar. So I mean, of course, if you have to pump a few liters, it may take thirty seconds or one minute or two minutes. But once the well is empty, the only thing you have to do is wait. Huh? So that is not a limiting factor. Then what we have also is that depending on uh, the requirement of the client, uh, what we will recover is a mix of some water and some uh, free phase. Uh, that goes into a settling tank to accumulate the free phase and to treat the water to our all water separator. Some customers want to uh, accelerate and pump as much as possible and uh, they are, don't care too much about treatment of water because they have many refinery, you have rain, etc. So I mean, even if you produce one or two cubic meters of water per, per day in the refinery, it's nothing. But when, when it rains, they have processes that can treat much more than that. So they, they can tell us, well, pump as much as you can, as fast as you can. If you produce one or two thousand liters of water per day, we don't care. We had other systems where the, the, the water was contaminated with unleaded petrol. That is very difficult to, uh, to treat. Uh, so they uh, require to uh, stop pumping when the em just before the, em uh, the the well was empty to ensure that we pump as little water as possible. So again, this depends on what what is the requirement, what does the client uh, want, um, and, and the capabilities. Uh, Indeed, inside the refinery, they have cap they, they they can take care of it. In yeah. the middle of nowhere, you have to separate and and, and treat yeah. it further at the surface. OK, also one thing that is important is that we, when, when, when we treat the water, it comes uh, if it has normal diesel or high, high uh, carbon hydrocarbons. Uh, it will, what we produce is water with 5 ppm of, uh, of um, hydrocarbon, which is rather low. And in most industrial uh, places, if you are at le that level of 5 ppm, you can uh, put that water back into the into the soil because when I mean, you have if you have two 60 centimeters of free face uh, there is no point sending p totally clean water back there because you you have free face <laughs> so you can rinse the soil by uh, just pouring the water that you have treated on on top of the place where you are pumping okay thank you and i'll take a, a last question because then we'll have to end the seminar it's uh... It's for the. It's more for Yannick. Uh, um, you recuperate, you recover product, then you have hydrocarbons most of the time. Can you use them as energy source in your burners? Yes, it's totally possible. And like Patrick just explained, we can have a really high uh, purity of uh, the contaminant at the end. So it can be a, a way to treat it afterwards and reuse uh, the contamination to to eat the soil. Maybe I can add one point. Uh, the, the, for, the project D, the fourth project that I have shown, 
the uh, fuel was the we recovered heating fuel was so clean that the operator used it itself to heat uh, its own uh, offices. They put two, two, two more filters at the entrance of the heating system and they burned their own oil. It so. is called recycling. You know, it's textbook recycling because it was combustible, it was fuel. You, I mean, we recover it and then we use it back as fuel. So it, it, is, it is recycling. I guess it depends on the purity of it and how you can treat it. But there is there should be no limit in particular to use it in the burners themselves who are used in this in the heating. All right. Well, um, first of all, let me thank our two speakers of today uh, very warmly. I think uh, it was uh, it was really well brought. Uh, congratulations to both of you. And um, and I will uh, end this uh, webinar of today. Uh, practical matters. You will all receive a follow up with uh, the, the documentation so you can uh, you can re relate on that. If you still have other questions, really don't hesitate. Shoot us an email, contact us. You have our coordinates. We'll follow up on, on uh, each and every lead. And uh, we would be happy to see you again on the on the webinar we're holding uh, next month and, uh, you know, making it a tradition. You're welcome and I hope it was very useful uh, for this. You also get some certificate on, on attending this webinar uh, again. Thank you very much. And uh, for those who are at lunch, have a good lunch. And for all the others, have a very good day or very good evening. Bye bye to all of you. Bye bye. Bye.